you to open your heart and your mind. I'd like for you to think with me this morning and turn on, turn your mind to Christ, turn your heart to Christ. And I'd like for you to think about how we've arrived at some of the places we've arrived in our lives. I'd like for us to think about how we've arrived at the places we arrive in our church life. Do we even know what we're doing? I mean, really, compared to the Bible, do we even know what we're doing? Because somebody taught us. So I'm going to define today a little bit the role of pastor, elder, bishop. When you read your Bible, those words are synonymous. Bishop, pastor, elder. Do you have chosen to go to the Eternity Baptist Church, at least today, and most of you for a while, where it has a single elder and then deacons who are not given authority like elders and then the congregation. Most Baptists have a congregationalist view. The ultimate authority on the earth, not, not just being, uh, speaking of human leadership, is the congregation. Did you understand that? When you go to a Baptist church, the pastor's not king. The church is supposed to be praying and supposed to be growing in Christ. And on matters of importance, the church should speak. So Baptist churches call their own pastor. They don't send them to you from headquarters. Everything in Baptist life is from the bottom up in human beings. And we forget that, and we don't get taught it, and then people don't know what to do. And then they thrust the deacons into roles that are never meant for deacons. And then the pastor gets thrust in and out of roles that are maybe not even what Scripture would tell him to do. Does that make any sense to anybody? So as I define the role of pastor, I'm not going to try to be self-serving. I'm trying to be scriptural. But as I describe the role of pastor, I want you to think as the role of congregant. I want you to think what it is to be a member of this church. And if you're not a member of this church, what it is to be the member of some church? And what it is to be a Christian in our service together in a local visible body where we try to express Christ with him being the head of the church and us in our various features of being the body of Christ. So uh, as we look at this, uh, I'm going to start at a weird place because it's one of the things we get thrust into that should not be the main emphasis of the church. Okay? Disputes. Disputes are a major item in the average Southern Baptist church. They're either growing, working through and avoiding a lot of disputes, or they don't have any disputes because they're apathetic and dead as a doornail. Or they have disputes that get blown up to the, area, to, to, to the level that only doctrinal theological things should be thrown up to. Everybody listening to me? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but how to store leftovers is, is not a big scriptural problem. Um, how to park, whether to have gravel or asphalt or whether to have wooden floors or carpeted floors or whatever, pews or chairs. There are things that churches get into it about. And then petty disputes between people. So the pastor walks into the average church and right away he has to discover what are the disputes and how long have they been going on and what are they about. And then no matter where you go, you've offended people because you've taken the so-and-so side. Everybody listening? That's church in a lot of Baptist churches. I don't like who you don't like. Let's be friends. And let's go to lunch and talk about the people we don't like or the things we don't agree with or whatever. And let's just labor on that. So we don't get around to doing what the Lord would have us do. One search committee, this is where a lot of the problem starts. The church elects a search committee. Somebody from some Baptist entity comes in and tries to describe to you how to form the biblical search committee. Well, one, I dare you to find me a biblical search committee in the Bible. 
There's not even a mention of a search committee in the Bible. Then you collect resumes. There's no mention of that in the Bible anywhere about collecting resumes from all over. Then we try to get representation of the church. And we say, we're going to need one deacon, one trustee, one WMU lady, one youth, blah, 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 to be representative of the church. Are they representative of the church? And what should be represented by the church? <coughs> Scriptural, godly ambition. Anybody listen to me? But a lot of churches go, we want an educated guy. We want an uneducated guy. We want a guy with 2.5 children. We want somebody under the age of 50. We don't want anybody over the age of whatever. Blah, 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 blah. What scriptures are these? What scriptures are these? Now, Rick Warren, who I don't agree with right now, but Rick Warren, when he wrote The Purpose Driven Church, I'm going to have to give him credit, but I don't want to mix his, his stats up. I don't know which one of these goes where, but they're one point off. When the average pastor goes into a church, either 89 or, 89 or 90 percent, I couldn't remember which one it is because the congregation is almost the same, but 89 or 90 percent of the pastors that go into a church think that their number one role is to reach a lost and dying world at the time that Rick Warren wrote that book. <clears throat> the average church member thinks the the purpose of the pastor is to meet their needs. Instant conflict. Whether you agree with the pastor's viewpoint about his number one job is to reach a lost and dying world, or whether you agree with the, uh, the point that the people are saying, no, your job is to be our chaplain and to take care of us, there's instant conflict, isn't there? Conflict of interest, conflict of, of desire, conflict of agenda. And I don't agree with either one of those, by the way. But anyhow... Uh, I'll explain that as I go along. So I'm making you think today is what I'm talking about. Let's, let's just kind of get this on here in our minds. Uh, now I want to talk to you about when the pastor or elder should be in dispute. When should you enter into conflict? And it's not about petty stuff, some of which I've already named, not going to rename. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Well, that sounds okay. Some men came down and were teaching the brothers, except they're giving them false teaching. Unless you are, sick, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. We have a problem right away. We have a problem when somebody says you've got to be circumcised to be saved. We've got a problem when somebody says you've got to be baptized to be saved. Do you have to fill out a form in triplicate to be saved? Must you walk the aisle to be saved? Must you bow down at the altar to be saved? Must you cry with real tears in order to be saved? Must you say these words, repeat after me, Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. Did you pray that prayer? Yes. Did Jesus come into your heart? I don't know. I don't know. Do you, do you feel like he's come into your heart? I don't feel anything. Well, it's not based on a feeling, brother. If you prayed that prayer, you're saved now. What verse is that? What verse is that? Where's the sinner's prayer in the Bible? How often did Jesus say, come say this to me and I will save you? How often did the apostles teach, say these words, this magic incantation, and thou shalt be saved? The Bible says if you believe in your heart. It talks about what you do to become a Christian. I don't have time to develop all that, but it has nothing to do with most of what we've baptized and turned it into this is how you're saved. So we, need, we got dispute in the church right now because did you know what's wrong with a, a lot of Baptist churches and a lot of other churches? They're filled with unregenerate people. And generations have passed since the first unsaved people were introduced into the congregation. And now they're the leaders. They're the elders. They're the deacons. They're the teachers. In a lot of churches, unsaved people are trying to run the church on the agenda that they've been taught and they run it on Baptist business or whatever other kind of thing you want to think of. Anybody listening to me? 
So far, nobody stood up and read me a verse saying, no, you're preaching lies right now, Brother Carl, because most of the stuff that I've been talking about that we ought not make a major thing of are not in the Bible. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. There are things that get all wound up about and have a big debate. There are things that you ought to argue about. There are things that you ought to stand your ground on. Like the doctrine of salvation. And the authority of Christ. And whether or not the Bible is the word of God. And then all these other issues that I'm not going to sit here and go on because i got a lot, a long way to go in a short time to get there. But I'm going to get as far as I can. They had a debate with him. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So Paul and Barnabas come along to confront even some of the other apostles who might go along with this. And they had to have the humility to receive the rebuke of Paul and Barnabas and repent of what was going to be a major heresy that was going to be placed in the church. Now, I wonder if an official apostle showed up at the Eternity Baptist Church and reviewed our documents and our stuff and what we say we believe. I wonder if we'd get rebuked. I don't know. I know on some of it. So that's one of the things you get busy doing if you're the pastor in a, and you're a single elder in a Baptist church. You have to get caught up in petty disputes that waste all your time and all your energy and effort while you're not even being able to pay attention to the major things that should be debated and should maybe be corrected. Everybody's still awake. And if the congregation is the final rule of human beings, then the congregation doesn't even bother to congregate. The majority of church in most churches doesn't even go to church. The majority of the members of most Baptist churches do not attend church. How are they going to discern the word of God and be taught by the pastor and the teachers the word of God so that they can make godly decisions based on scripture if they don't even go to church? How can you have congregational rule without a congregation? Everybody still awake? All right, let's keep going. I'm going to the next thing. Prayer for the sick upon request. Now, I've done this so much. I have done this so much that I am unscriptural. I have. So old Brother Don comes up here and he sings. And uh, he, it's obvious he's in pain and he's got surgeries coming and other physical problems. And I say, everybody who's willing, come up and lay hands on Brother Don before we leave this morning and pray for him. And everybody would say, amen. Well, I don't think that's bad, but I don't think it's what the scripture teaches. Are you listening to me? I think everybody in here can pray for everybody in here. The scripture teaches that too. But what about this part? Is anyone among you sick? <clears throat> Let him call for the elders of the church. Who's supposed to call for this prayer meeting? Come on, work with me. Who's supposed to ask for the prayer meeting for the sick? The sick. Who are they supposed to call? The elders. In a Baptist church like this, there are only one elder. Who should he bring with him to lay hands on the sick? Nobody? Could there be a problem with a single elder? Let him call for the elders with an S of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And in their culture, it was actually representative of a blessing because people used oil. But what I'm trying to tell you is we just 
shoot through here and we've adjusted it and we got our way of doing it and we do it when whatever of the congregation has congregated, we call on everybody there because we don't have distinguished elders. And elders should be people who are astute in the scriptures, able to teach or preach. And so there should be several men in the church. A healthy church should have a few men or several who the congregation looks at as being the elders. And so when there's a, a dispute in the church about doctrine and theology, the elders would get together and study the scriptures and pray and come back with recommendation to the congregation about what to do about that. And then when somebody got sick, they'd call and the elders would go and lay hands on them and pray and anoint them with oil. Hmm. Number three, and these are not in any great order because I was, I was going to go over this with, the, with the, the committees that are meeting tomorrow night, but I thought the whole congregation needed to hear it and then the committee will already be warmed up. <laughs> Number three, what am I supposed to do as a single elder, pastor, bishop? Or what are they supposed to do, whatever you've got of elders? They're to oversee and watch out for the church. So I exhort the elders among you. This is neat because Peter is an apostle, and I'm not an apostle. There are no apostles today. We'll talk about that another time if you want to sit and argue. There are not modern-day apostles. They were appointed by Jesus, and in order to be a biblical apostle, you have to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Even Paul got a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus on the road to... Anybody still awake? There's all kinds of junk being taught in the church, the big church, the TV church, the whatever, you know what I'm talking about. All kinds of crazy. I don't have time to go into all of it. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. But now, Peter's serving not only as an apostle in that distinct role with just a few other men, but he's serving in another role in church with many men and many men to come in the office of elder or overseer in local church settings. As a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, so he saw Christ, that makes him an apostle, as well as a partaker in the glory which is to be revealed. But here's the word we want to key on for the today. Uh, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Now, what does shepherd mean? It means a lot. And I heard John MacArthur preach because he went to New Zealand and saw a bunch of sheep. And he has this sermon about sheep. Oh, my gosh. It gets messy. Because guess what you got to do to a huge herd of sheep? You have to trim the wool around their backside or they'll get all clogged up and die from not being able to go to the bathroom. Being a shepherd is not a very glamorous job. <laughs> they also protect the sheep. Watch out for them. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. You can't exercise oversight over people who don't congregate, and you can't exercise oversight over people who reject your position and your place in their life. The average person in America is so individualistic that if you said, I, I need to shepherd you a minute, I, I've got something I need to talk to you about in your life. I've got something I need to point out. Fat boy, I, I do, I live my own, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not putting up with this junk. This is not church. This is not what we've ever had. This is not what we're used to. This is not what we asked for. This is not what we ask you to do. This is not what we want done in our life. Blah, 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 blah. So it's unscriptural. Amen? It's unscriptural. Exercise oversight. Now, listen to the rules. Not under compulsion. Not because you got to. If you get to the place, the only reason you do your job is because you got to, you ought to do something else. Amen? Not under compulsion. But willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain. I watched a bunch of junk on YouTube the other day, and these guys, my goodness, 
10.5 million for this, 64 million for this plane. And they'll tell you flat out to your face, a bunch of them, that God wants them to have all that stuff and he wants you to have some of that stuff, not near as much as them because you've got to give your stuff. To them. Not for shameful gain. Not to the point that you live better than everybody in the church. Now, if you live in a rich community, I guess you get paid better. And if you live in a poor community, you get paid less. Something of a normal, somebody ought to arrive at something trying to be biblical about the pay of the pastor. Amen? But eagerly, I couldn't wait to get here to preach this. Eagerly, I want to feed the sheep. Not, dominor, not, not domineering over those in your charge. You better do what I tell you today or God will kill you on your way home. That ain't true. You understand me? Not, not Lord Norvia. One of our members this morning walked by my office going in there to do child care and called me a beatnik. Where do you get off with that? And as soon as we go to lunch, I'm going to ask her. I'm making a joke. My wife helped me cut my beard off. But anyhow, she said, hello, beat Nick. I said, is it the shirt? Is it the shirt? But your people shouldn't, you shouldn't domineer your people where you just, there are people that preach crazy stuff that if you don't do what I tell you, you're going to get it. You should do what the Bible tells you to do, and when the pastor or elder or somebody brings it to your attention, you ought to repent and do it or quit doing it. Amen? But not because you're scared they're going to smack you or choke you or something. But being examples to the flock. If, a pastor can, if I can't say to you, pray like I pray and you'll be okay, read your Bible like I read my Bible and you'll be okay, treat your wife like I treat my wife, I make jokes and I go on about my wife. She is back there in child care today. But I aggravate and go on with my wife. But you ask her. Just take her off to the side sometime. Just like they do at the hospital. Do you feel safe at home? Huh? I got in trouble on that one. I'm not doing it anymore. Now they ask, do you have a weapon? I can't even take my pocket knife in, my little pocket knife in my bag where I carry all my junk. I can't have that. But you ask my wife, does he take care of you? And she'll laugh you to the ground if you said he doesn't give you good stuff and he doesn't take care of you. But I want my congregation to say he, he would give me the shirt off his back. He would treat me like Christ would have him treat me. I can't tell you I love you like people do in the Bible because I've never said, dear God, put me in hell if you need to like Paul and Moses. but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Am I going to get a crown of glory from the boss, the master, king of kings and lord of lords, the true head of this church, the shepherd? Is he going to give me reward? or loss of reward. Not only should the pastor, elder, bishop, overseer be concerned about what Jesus has to say about their performance and their duties with the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit and grace, but so should the congregation. Amen? Shouldn't you care what Jesus is going to say about your part you played? and who you were in the church? Number four, to watch out for the spiritual life of the flock, continuing that. Lead. Be authorized by the congregation to be their lead. You don't authorize yourself. God told me to pastor this church. I'm scared of that guy right away. If God's going to tell me to pastor a church, guess who he'll let in on it and they'll know that God told me to pastor the church. 
Amen, Dan said. The rest of the church, I don't call myself to churches. Churches call me and say, would you be our pastor? Amen? In doing so, it's implied that they've authorized me to do my job, but if the people don't know what my job is, they're not going to know if I'm doing it or not. Amen? Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. People hate that word submit. You do a wedding. I'm not saying submit. Well, you're already headed for a, a train wreck when you've got two 50-50 partners. You're, you're going to set. If you truly exercise 50-50 partnership in every decision, you're never going on vacation. You're never going over to see your mother. Anybody listen to me? I'm not being smart, Ellie. Can you read the Bible? No, I don't follow the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. I'm, I'm modernized. I'm not talking about a domineering, overbearing husband. Hey, get in the car. But I am talking about a tiebreaker who's been given the same pastoral duties by his wife as the pastor's been given pastoral duties to pastor the whole church. Amen? Ouch. Uh. You'll be going to see a pastor or a certified worldly counselor if you don't have any peck and order in your home. And then while you two are fighting, the kids will run it. I didn't write the Bible. I'm just preaching it. Obey your leaders and submit to them. What's that mean? Follow their leadership. For they are keeping watch over your soul. Now, I don't want you to answer this out loud, but you know what my job is? To keep watch over your soul. Do you know why I tell you about false teachers and false preachers and false doctrine? It's my job before Jesus to keep you in truth. I got to answer to Jesus on whether or not I helped keep you in truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. I got to keep you grounded in scripture. Rightly divided and literally applied to your life. If this church buys in the wrong gravel, I'll be okay with God. But if this church teaches heresy in this world we're living in, or just light false teaching, I'm failing as the chief teacher of the church. The pastor, elders, should be the chief teachers of the church because they should be the ones who are in the word most consistently, above and beyond average. Anybody still awake? Oh, he raised his voice. Some people are saying, I'm not going to listen to anything else he's got to say because he yells. You're lucky you weren't on my little, little league baseball team. <laughs> I yelled all the time when I coached kids, wanting everybody to score in basketball and wanting every kid to get a hit or catch a ball or something in baseball. I wasn't demeaning them, but I wanted them to have a good experience so they could say I was successful in my little league career. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who, who will give an account. I, don't have, I, I might have to give an account to the congregation. That's scary enough, but I think this means I've got to give an account to God himself. Listen to this part. Let them do this with joy. And not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. It's to your advantage to make my job working with you joyful. Anybody awake? It's every kid in this room's job to make your parents' job joyful if you're a Christian kid. Because pastoring's a lot like parenting. And pastor and a lot of people in this room, it is a joy. It should be with everybody in the room that being your pastor is a joy. Because guess who it costs if you make it not a joy? You. 
It's not profitable for you. Well, that's self-serving. No, it's Bible. Accountable to Christ, the pastor and the congregation. Amen. Number five, spend time in the word and prayer. I'm going to tell you something you might not like. I had people, I've always had people drive by the church to see if my car is in the parking lot. That's because you don't know one thing about scripture from another. Where is the most private place I can pray uninterrupted? And if it's at the church, so be it. But if it's in a room or on a chair or out in the woods, I'm no pastor if I don't spend time with the Lord. And I'm no effective pastor if I don't spend time in the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God and praying the Word of God and really enthralled with the Word of God, not just to develop sermons and lesson plans, but to walk with the Lord and to hear from the Lord because the number one way the Lord speaks to us is through His Word. Am I still awake? So when you do need to walk in and talk to the pastor about something, when you like to walk into a guy full of God and full of prayer and who's worded up to overflow instead of running into a guy who came to the office so that brother so-and-so could drive by and go, oh, oh, as the overseer of the pastor, I think you should be here doing this and there doing that and here doing that. I don't have to go to God to get my assignment in the average Baptist church. I got some Johnny come lately who wants to tell me what to do. And it's usually some little wimp who can't get his way at home, so he flexes his muscles at church. Just an observation. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Uh, contra I've heard this before. I'd like to find this. I'd like for somebody to show it to me in the Bible. I've searched for it that deacons ought to be apt to teach. It does not say that. It does not say that at all. It says elders should be apt to teach. You know what deacons have to be? Willing to serve. It's what the whole word means. Service. Some deacons can teach. Some deacons can preach. But it's not a requirement to be a deacon that you teach. But it is a requirement that you're not only able but willing and doing teaching if you're an elder in a church. And you can't do... I, I was so unscriptural, I did everything trying to be a good servant because elders are supposed to be servants. But I used to mow the yard at church. You know, at churches I've been, I mowed the yard and I took care of making sure the vehicles ran and running around doing maintenance and whatever, trying to be a good servant boy, you know, a hireling, and not spend enough time in the Word of God and prayer to be an effective pastor to the standards and levels that God would have you be. But as I've matured, God is so wonderful, if you won't sit down and be quiet when He tells you to, He can just set you down and make you where you can't get around. Isn't He wonderful? And I don't mean that with any sarcasm. Isn't He wonderful? You ever had trouble looking up to the Lord? Anybody listening to me? You ever had trouble looking up to the Lord? Well, I'm going to guarantee you this. They say there's no atheists in foxholes. There's not many atheists laying on your back with nothing to do but count them little dots in the ceiling at the hospital. If you're strapped in with nowhere to go, all of a sudden you got time to talk to the Lord. Isn't it amazing? <clears throat> Next. Some sub points. Elder, pastor, care, protector. I want you to listen. Does that, you know, see what I, you, you know why we taught you in Grudem about Scripture first? Because if you don't believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, still applicable in today's stuff, I got nothing to offer you. 
nothing of any pertinence, nothing of any spiritual value if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God and you want to rightly divide it and apply it to your situation. I've got nothing to offer you. You know how to have church on Sundays mostly? The saved. You know how to get out after they've been saved and doing? You know what they ought to do during the week? Tell people about Jesus. It's okay to bring lost people to church, but that's not the main focus to make lost people all comfortable at church and not use any theological words or any doctrinal words. You need to feed the sheep the word of God. Still, still with me? I think he thinks he's supposed to feed us the word of God. Oh, good. Pay careful attention. Acts 20, 28. Listen to these words. They, they're chilling. They're spine tingling. Not chilling as in scary, but spine tingling. Pay careful to yourselves. Pay careful attention to yourselves. And to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I'm supposed to be an overseer on assignment by the Holy Spirit of a bunch of people who have been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's why I preach about these people who are available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Fat boy here learned how to get on YouTube and navigate it on the TV, and I've been watching lots of documentaries and lots of stuff about all the guys that are teaching these days, and I'm going to be able to name them by name and be right, and their associates. And I'm going to warn you not to pay attention to them because if they're false about half the time, they're just not worth messing around to try to figure it out. Amen? Amen. And among your own selves will arise, <coughs> uh-oh, not just outsiders, men speaking twisted things. In my opinion... The Eternity Baptist Church at certain periods of its life has been moderate to liberal leaning. And you got me, who most people say he's too conservative. I wasn't going to, in these days, I worried about getting you informed about what I believe God would have us do, letting you digest that and then coming back, because I know in the average Baptist church, you change pastors like changing socks. And what I'm saying is the search committee for the next guy is able to come home with somebody who reverses half of what I'd have you do. If you've gone to church here long enough, you know what I'm talking about. And if you've gone to church long enough, and then, then people say stuff like this. Are you listening to me? We thank God for all the variety of different kinds of preachers we've had. Really? Scriptural? Unscriptural? Really? I know that after my departure, okay, jump down here. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. People rise up in church who'll take your people down a wrong path. Usually in the beginning with well intentions. I'll give them that. They think they're doing the right thing, but they, they, they don't have anything to do with the Bible. It's a step away from the Bible and another step away from the Bible and then throw in a little heresy here, a little false teaching there, and pretty soon you got nuts. Therefore, be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Paul said, man, I have put in three years with you people as a chief apostle and I poured into you day and night 
with tears. Don't walk away from truth. Passionate. Compassionate. Handle the word as a teacher. Therefore, an overseer, bishop, elder, pastor, must be above reproach. Do you know why I don't ever yell at him at the drive through window? That might be a reproach. Do you know why I don't face, put stuff on Facebook about people? Because it could be considered a reproach. <clears throat> Do you know why I go back to the bank if they give me too much money? I could be considered a thief. I think it costs too much to buy anything in these days. Does anybody else? The other day at a restaurant, they didn't charge me for my drink and they didn't charge me for a change I'd made in my food. I got something instead of something and my bill was lower than it ever is. <coughs> and it was about what it ought to be. <laughs> but I felt compelled to tell the head waitress trying not to get the other person in trouble, but I said, I don't think you're charging me enough today. <coughs> and she looked at my stuff and looked up and charged me the rest of it. Because I don't want to say that preacher, yeah. overseer, elder, pastor, bishop from the Eternity Baptist Church, he'll rip you off if he gets a chance. Now, I'm also the kind of guy that goes, that's a dollar more than it says on the menu. <laughs> Amen but I'm not going to cuss and yell and scream and post something about how terrible they are if I do get overcharged. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. Solomon's supposed to be so wise, and he had a thousand of them. I just got to tell you, one is plenty. That one keeps me hopping. No, but the husband of one wife, a one-woman man. We may have to get into that one these days when we try to figure out what that means. One-woman man. I'm not going to go into it right now. You can praise God for that. You'd be here all day. Sober-minded. I'm out of my light pain medicine, and I got a couple heavy pain medicines left over. And this morning I thought, would you rather be in pain or make sure you're totally sober? And I've taken the heavier stuff and come and preached and it didn't seem to make any difference. But, but I was so enthralled with what I was going to talk about today, I didn't want to be deluded in any way. With prescription medicine, certainly not liquor, and also not anger and emotion-driven and crazy. Anybody awake? I want to be sober-minded. How many of you are sober-minded? You better think with me a minute because every time you lose your temper, you're drunk on anger. And every time you rattle your mouth and dog stuff, you're a gossip out of control. You're not sober. You're an affront to the kingdom of God. And you say, listen to him. I usually have people laugh at me when I'm talking like this. Laughing at me, uh, probably shouldn't because I'm because of my title. But the thing of it is, is you're going to laugh in the face of the one who wrote this. Self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. That's for elders. Be that. You know who ought to be teaching young women in this church? According to the Bible, older godly women. 
what do we do in the Baptist church? We'll get a class full of men, older men, and a class full of older women, and if we're not careful, we can't get anybody to do anything, so we'll shove them in a 25-year-old teacher because nobody will do it. Those 25-year-olds ought to be sitting at the feet of some of these women who have been in the Word of God all their life. Amen? But Titus 1.9. Still with me? He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Boy, this just keeps going on on these qualifications about leaders, elders. Hold on to the trustworthy word as taught. Paul taught it to Timothy and Titus, and they taught it to other people, and the instruction in the Bible is to keep passing it on to other men and teaching them. So we should have kept going down the lines with godly men. But in America, our education system for preachers is corrupt and weak. Not every bit of it, but a lot of it. Corrupt and or weak. Because the church growth movement has ruined most churches. And I'll tell you why, maybe in this message and maybe in another one. Doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. You're supposed to rebuke people who contradict truth. Anybody still awake? I'm trying to talk to you just kind of normal. I mean, is it better if I yell and spit or something? You gotta reprove it. You gotta you gotta say it. And it, it scares me to say it to somebody. That's a little off. I try to figure out how to do it without it being a major deal. You should have done it from the pulpit so I wouldn't have to do it in private, and that's stupid and wrong. Unless it's spread through the whole church, and then you got to do it, whatever. Second Timothy four two. <laughs> Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. I'm ready to roll. I heard about a guy the other day that his notes got messed up because of the electric storm, so he had to, some woman preach. How long you got to be a pastor before you can get up and preach at the drop of a hat? I'm not trying to brag, but I'll just tell you, everybody I know my age who's worth a hoot and younger, some of them, a bunch of them, you could walk into a revival, the guest speaker could get held up in traffic, and they say you're going to preach, and then while they're, sing while they're singing, God would give you a message to get up out of stuff you already know. Amen. Be, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Listen to these three words. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Reprove is a mild reprimand. A mild reprimand. Rebuke is a sharp reprimand. Exhort is strongly encourage and urge. You know what you got to do if you want to be an elder in a church? Listen to me real close right now because some of you would consider yourself sort of an elder. If all you want to do is the exhort part and you won't do the rebuke and reprove part, you ought to watch Joel Osteen because that's what he does. It's like parenting. You got to do the hard part with the fun part or you're going to be their buddy and pal and never their friend. I just hung around my sons, and at this point in our lives, they're my friends. 33 and 36. They're co-laborers with Christ. And either one of them could be elder in their church if they wanted to lay elders. 
spend time in the Word and prayer. Boy, this sermon just got shorter. Turn the right page. If you ain't been to anything else, y'all be glad about that. Listen to this one real fast. Let the elders, 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Do you know what you ought to call me? Brother Carl. Pastor. Preacher. You ought not teach your kids to walk up to me and say, Carl. If I'm only worthy of a six-year-old's Carl, then I'm not really going to be qualified to step in as an elder in their life. Now, you don't have to call me Holy Reverend. Reverend only refers to a holy God. In the Old Testament, I'm not reverend. But hey, pastor, hey, preacher. You know, now somebody, that, we've had people in this church who'd have a heyday with that in the hall. When we leave today, they would go, hey, reverend, preacher, pastor, your eminence, well, what I got to call you? Uh. <laughs> Anybody here? That's real respectful. That really gains the ground of the position. I dare to think that people have a low opinion of those who God's put in their life to help them and guide them in the word of God, their teacher, their preacher, their whatever. Are you listening to me? I think they have a low opinion of the master. And it runs through everything else they do. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. First Timothy 5.19. Sometimes you've got to correct the elder. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. This needs to be serious when you're going to go dog the elders. Amen? You need to have witnesses. I think he stole money. Get the witnesses. You know? Verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, preacher gets up, won't preach, whatever, won't do his job. If he persists in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so the rest may stand in fear. Now, there's been a time in church life that I knew people wouldn't do that. Boy, today, if you told people to cut loose, <laughs> better have kind of a system for that or you'd be in there all day. You know what? Don't like your little whiskers on your chin. You look like Chesty, the potato chip boy. Anybody remember him? Huh. But if we, do, if we get honest in church and exercise church discipline about weighty matters, everybody go, I'm cutting that out. Amen? James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers. Now, this would apply to men and women. I know it says my brothers. But the same Bible teaches for women to teach women. Godly women to teach women. So I think this truth would be either way. Now this is about an elder, but it could be about anybody handling the word of God. As far as the principles and precepts, are you getting my dig here? I'm not saying all women need to be elders. I'm saying anybody who handles the word of God needs to be serious. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I, I got to answer to Jesus for what I teach and preach and for what you teach and preach. But how can I be responsible if I, I never get to talk to you? I don't have any forum to talk to you. You got your own little kingdom and everybody's got their own little kingdom. Does that make sense? I don't have to answer some preacher. Do you answer to God? And if you do answer to God, he wants to set up the system. It's God's system. If it's in God's word, rightly divided and ably applied, it is God's system. 
When you rebel against your husband, you're violating God's system. When your children rebel against you parents, they're violating God's system. When the church rebels against the pastor, elders, whatever they got, without cause, without going through the procedure of rebuking them, then you're in rebellion. There's room for repentance from us preachers and there's room for repentance for the congregation because we're serving the master. Last bunch of scripture. I desire. Paul says, my will. I love this when people say this. They'll say, Jesus never said anything about whatever topic. Jesus said everything that's in the Bible. He authorized the apostles to finish the rest of what he wanted to talk to the churches. So what Peter says and what Paul says has as much authority as anything that Jesus says. What? Not as men, as apostles who the Holy Spirit protected and guided and caused them to think and write down the right stuff. Well, I don't agree with that stuff that Paul said. Then you don't agree with God. Paul says, I desire, my will, is that in every place the men which should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. How do you think Paul would feel about the average Baptist church? Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. I'm not going to go into this very far. But when you go to something and all the regular men, all you regular men, listen to me, you know when somebody goes by that's attractive and they're showing body parts, men have trouble concentrating on the Lord. It's a bunch of cowards. Nobody amen it because you don't want your wife to know. Men are made different than women. Women usually don't want to have sex with just anybody walking by. They do in this culture. But usually a woman thinks she's got to love them, be attracted to them. A guy just got to see something and go in heat like old Rover does. And he's ready to roll in about 10 seconds. A natural man, fallen man, are you listening to me? We come to church. I got guys I listen to think you ought to wear a suit and tie when you go to church. My grandma would have thought that. I'm just glad to get here <laughs> at this point. <coughs> but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Your concern, woman should be to represent Christ in the same way I don't want to make a scene at a restaurant and bring reproach on the name of Christ. You should not want to make a scene in some guy's mind. Now, there are guys that could lust for you if you came in here with a Muslim outfit on. You know, they just imagine what's under the Muslim outfit. Well, they're just on their own before the Lord then. Amen? Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Okay. I don't believe in women preachers. The Bible doesn't teach it. But I don't believe in a lot of men preachers because they're unqualified. The Southern Baptist Convention is going to fall apart because they kicked out some churches for having women pastors, but they didn't kick out the other thousand that have women pastors. And they never address, so far, the good old boys club has never addressed men who are unfit to be in the pulpit. So there would be multiple thousands of people disfellowshipped. But I think old George Washington's picture 
will come into play and will modify our views. We'll be more dedicated to our SBC causes and the dollars it takes to do them than we are to the Word of God. And I can't change the SBC and I can't change the Illinois Baptist State Association and I can't have any influence in the Kaskaskia Baptist Association. I've tried. So I'm going to take my ball and go home and try to exercise what influence God gives me in this congregation and in my family. Anybody awake? Hmm. That was tough for an egotistical maniac who wanted to change everything. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And guess whose sin... Guess whose sin condemned all the world? Adam's. Because he is the patriarch. He is the head. She was made for him. Because she bought into the devil's story, he didn't need to. If he had done his job right, he would have said, Eve, there is no way we're doing this. And took leadership. So as the federal state... The head man, the first man, it's Adam's fault. And Eve's too, but her secondary and his primary because he's the patriarch. Oh, maybe I do like this complementarian view after all. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I'm complementarian. I believe that Eve complements Adam. I believe a woman is your fulfiller. When your woman that God gives you comes by your side, you're finally a complete person. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We're one. When we go into union in the bonds of our marriage, we are in union. That's what that needs to be saved for because it's a picture of the church. I'm not egalitarian. I'm not going to turn you here right now, but Galatians 3, 26 through 29 talks about there's no longer male nor female, blah, blah, you know, the whole deal. June or Greek. Yeah, in essence, every woman in this room is worth as much to God as any man in this room. But we have different roles. God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. God the Son is the second person of the Trinity. God the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God the Holy Spirit is as much as God as God the Son and God the Father. God the Son is as much God as God the Holy Spirit and God the Father. They're all equal in essence. The three persons, yet one God, but they have different roles by their own choosing. Are you listening to me? Jesus is not a lesser God than God the Father. And you're not a lesser child of God than I am, ladies. <coughs> We're equal in essence. But we have to have different roles. And if the church was all men, we'd still have to have different roles because not everybody could be the pastor, the lead pastor. Even if you had multiple elders, somebody's got to be the guy that calls the meeting. Anybody still awake? This stuff is not divisive and this stuff is not mean. The world is nuts. And because we lost respect for God and God's institutions, made no fault divorce, and just kept going down the line, allowing unscriptural things and unscriptural things and more things off those unscriptural things till the church is impure in many places and in multiple ways. And we quit being salt and light. Now, 
people who go to church want to be open-minded about grinding boys down to not be boys and grinding off stuff that girls have and letting them choose their self and the parents not be informed. We live in a world right now, I got took off stinking YouTube the other day for something I said. I don't know why, why they bleeped our sermon. But anyhow, I'm big time with all 12 followers. But anyhow, one, one of them must have worked for somebody. But anyhow, this, all, this could all be put away if we would just go back to God. If you had a country that was influenced by the word of God, the non-Christians would conform to a Judeo-Christian ethic and you could have a little peace in the valley. But we need to be scriptural, not pragmatic. When I, when I saw the crowd that I had gathered up here this morning at first, I can't, that's why I don't come in here early. It scares me to death. We could fill this building up. We could do what other people are doing. We could do what we used to do. Have an event. Have a deal. You know what we've said? Jesus can't get it done. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit can't get it done. We got to draw people with stuff. And then we got to keep them with stuff. Who should I feed on Sunday morning? Wolves? Goats? Sheep? If goats and wolves find it distasteful, there's a certain amount of people don't want to hear me preach. And they're good people who love Jesus and they'd rather hear somebody else preach. God bless them on their journey. But there's a bunch of people who don't want to hear you preach because they don't want to hear anybody preach the truth. And in Baptist churches, we used to love to fan it when people's preaching the truth, going amen, hallelujah, because we got our dose of penance. Thank you for beating the snot out of me today, preacher. I needed it. I'm not going to live it. I'm not going to do anything with it. It's preaching for entertainment. Boy, he got with it today. Thank God for pulpiteering, except Paul said that's baloney. Amen. I got more to say to you at my age and so do other guys my age than somebody can get up here and do cartwheels. I got to be scriptural, not pragmatic. It's not my job to fill this building. We need a hundred adults to pay the bills around here. Maybe we don't need such a big building. We need to evangelize, and we're going to work on this tomorrow night at our meeting. The idea of how to get it going, because we folded our tent because a secretary left the church. Somebody who was keeping records left the church, and I just let it go. And we didn't quit to do. But there sits a man right there sitting in this side, who a couple of people went to his door right in a neighborhood, ends up coming to church, ends up getting saved, goes around, and he, in his humble way, picks up all the trash that blows up on our parking lots every week just to do something for the Lord. Amen? Amen. But So we're going to have to figure out how to evangelize. And I don't want to hear all the stuff that doesn't work and all the excuses to get out of it. We're just going to have to figure out how to get out with the word. Planned and spontaneous. Are you listening to me? You say, I do all my witness, and as the Holy Spirit opens it up, he, goody. Goody. Win some people to the Lord on your own plan. I don't care. We need to be theological and doctrinal. It's important. It's Bible, functional. Not expedient. We need to be godly, spiritual. 
one more can of worms, and I'll just brush over it. The feminization of church. I'm not talking about everything about women. I'm talking about sissy. Sissified. And when Jesus got on that cross, it was blood and guts. Literally. And the people who served him, those apostles, all got their heads cut off and beat up. And the day that's coming to America in the very near future, unless there's a giant revival, you watch and see because it won't be funny at all. There was a guy here Wednesday night going to church with us from Pakistan. Guess what happened in an area of Pakistan he's very familiar with? The radical Muslims, not all Muslims, but the radical Muslims burned 40 churches. I did my homework. 1977, the British Empire gave up rule over India. India became an independent state, but their Hindus and the Muslims couldn't get along. So there was formed East Pakistan and West Pakistan, which was more Muslim. And the Hindu part was more of India. Well, that didn't settle it, just divide them up like that. So they had disputes in the 1960s, wars, and they had a war in 1971. And then East Pakistan became Bangladesh. You say, what are you preaching to us about that for? Because you need a globe. I ordered me a globe. Because we try to do stuff around the world. But they burnt 40 churches. And I, I just want to see your face if we were gathered up in somebody's barn today and they had just burned all the churches in Centralia. And I'm not talking about Muslims. I'm talking about whoever. Whoever Satan used burned all of our buildings to the ground. And then when we started meeting in barns and schools or whatever we could find, they beat the snot out of about half of us for going. And now they're starting to kill our members for saying Jesus. <coughs> that could never happen here. Because it could never happen in Pakistan. It could never happen in India. It could never happen in China. No, we're America. You watch the news about the majority of America. Why should God intervene on our behalf? Save for the remnant of a church. I intend to be part of a remnant of a church. Do you? Well, he's radical. He's nuts. You're right. I'm radical. I hope you're not right about being nuts. Is your relationship to Jesus Christ the most important thing in your whole world? Is allegiance to his word, his way, and his will the driving force of your worldview and your practical life? If it's not, you're a subpar Christian. You've said a prayer, you filled out a card, and you hope when you die you go to heaven, but in between you're going to live like hell as much as you want. And you're not on crack. You're not sleeping around. You're just a good old boy or good old girl who's got a little dose of Jesus just in case. And you might just split hell wide open when you croak. That was terrible. He got right up to the end and had to say something mean. I didn't say anything mean. I said something to help you. If you're a lost church member, you ought to get saved. And if you're a saved church member, you ought to live for Christ. Thus we shall sing a song, give you time to think about that and pray about it. I'm serious.
This is a time of reflection that should lead in some people's life to a time of repentance. Have you ever repented? Turned away from your sin and turned to Christ in full allegiance and attachment? How many of you people sitting in this room have ever been tempted to just go on autopilot and glide? To retire on God. Oh, not about your personal needs. I'm talking about service through a local visible church. I, I'm, I'm cutting that crud out. What if we made it where it was real? Heavenly Father, have your way with our time of meditation and repentance and reflection on your word. Would you please speak to us? O oh, Holy Spirit, move through our hearts. and In Jesus' name we will pray. And Heavenly Father, hear us. For we need your intervention. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.